Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Reaney. I'm the director of the graduate program in medical and biological illustration in the Department of Art as Applied to Medicine at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. On behalf of all of our faculty, Corey Sandone, the department director, Gary Lees, our director emeritus, Tim Phelps, Jenny Fairman, Juan Garcia, Lydia Gregg, Jeff Day, and all of the extended faculty and staff, I want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule to celebrate this very special day marking the completion of the thesis projects by our second year students. What you're about to see is the result of about nine months of very intense work. The thesis project requires students to immerse themselves into a scientific subject matter or an artistic technique that they may have been not entirely aware of before the onset of the project. The projects require them to take on roles that include illustrator, researcher, writer, editor, storyboard artist, programmer, sculptor, and many others, and now, of course, presenter as well. By delving deeply and exploring these projects, students are forced to draw upon their skills that they brought with them to Hopkins, but of course also employ a lot of the techniques and the skills that we've had the pleasure to work with them on over the last two years. What you're about to see will be visually captivating, it will be artistically compelling, all of the work is done with great care and craftspersonship. But as we watch the results, I invite you to join me in looking deeper into these projects, first of all to recognize all that must have gone in to bring them to fruition, but also to recognize some of the unique contributions that each of the projects have made, both to the scientific subject matter and also to the biomedical communication challenge. Through these projects, the students have shown that they have the skills and the knowledge to advance public health and medical education by educating clinicians and researchers and patients alike. These projects also show the very core of what we do as medical illustrators, and that is uh, first knowing all that we can possibly know about a subject matter, uh, thoroughly understanding our audience, understanding the visual challenge, and using visual techniques to hopefully bridge the gap between the teacher and the learner. We are immensely proud of the job that the second year students have done this year. And of course, we're exceptionally proud because they were thrown um, a challenge that most years are not about a week and a half before the deadline for the thesis completion for graduation was when we received the order to teach and to work remotely. But the second year students did not miss a beat. They adapted and they retooled and they stayed incredibly productive and as you can see in a few minutes, it doesn't appear to have affected the amazing results that they got. I'd like to take just a moment to thank a few special people. First, I'd like to thank Sarah Poynton. Sarah Poynton is an associate professor uh, for time in our department and works with our students during the writing process of the thesis, but also works with them very closely as they're preparing for today. And I would also like to thank Daisha Balch. Daisha, Daisha is the administrator for the graduate program. For those of you who know Daisha, you know that she um, does uh, so much for the students year-round at all times, but she worked especially hard with me in preparing today, so I'd like to thank Daisha for all of her work, um, both recently and throughout the year. Just a quick overview of how today is going to work. You're all watching me on YouTube Live. Um, I'm going to play each of the seven presentations which have been pre-recorded to avoid any potential um, technological glitches. At the end, you'll be asked to just relax for a moment or two, and we will um, then feed through a Zoom meeting that will include the faculty and the preceptors that the students worked with. We um, hope that you will listen and participate, and although you won't be able to ask questions live, we encourage you to ask questions and make comments through the YouTube chat function. And in fact, if you would like to pose questions or make comments during the presentations, and or during the question and answer period, that would be fine. During the question and answer session, I'll do my best to try to balance the YouTube questions with the live questions uh, from the Zoom meeting. So if you would, um, join me in sitting back and watching seven uh, wonderful projects and help me celebrate, help us celebrate, 
the wonderful work that the students have done. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Jamie Peterson. I'm a Master's of Arts candidate in Medical and Biological Illustration. This is my presentation on my master's thesis, Visualizing Cochlear Specializations that Enhance Protection of Hearing Function in Bats. The cochlea is a fluid-filled coil of the inner ear located in the temporal bone shown in the bat skull in blue. It transforms sound waves into electrical signals for processing in the brain. The loss of cochlear sensory hair cells and damage to nerve fibers over time cause age-related hearing loss. The 3D model to the right illustrates the external cochlea structures. The house mouse, or mus musculus, is a common and familiar lab model used for studying the mammalian auditory system. The big brown bat, or Aptesicus fuscus, exhibits unique resistance to age-related hearing loss, allowing them to use echolocation throughout their lifetime. The focus of this thesis was comparing cochlear morphological differences between the big brown bat and house mouse. There is a lack of educational resources for comparative cochlear anatomy and visual side-by-side -side comparison of the big brown bat and mouse. The 3D structure of the cochlea is difficult to visualize due to its location in the bony labyrinth and small size. Objectives for this project were to first communicate comparative cochlear anatomy of the big brown bat and mouse by creating an interactive educational resource and 3D cochlear overview animation. Second, to create interactive 3D cochlear models as an educational resource. And third, promote the significance of bat noise-induced hearing loss research and its potential impact on strengthening the understanding of human age-related and noise-induced hearing loss. Primary audience included auditory researchers, neuropathologists, graduate students, and a secondary lay audience with an interest in biology. Types of data used in this project included micro-CT data, which is a high-resolution 3D imaging technique utilizing x-rays. Cochlea serial sections were embedded in plastic, and sectioned into 30 micrometer zero sections and stained with tulodine blue. Sources of the data sets included the Lara Lab, the Whiting School of Engineering, and the McCusick Nathan's Department of Genetic Medicine at Johns Hopkins University, the Pound Human Identification Laboratory at the University of Florida, and the free online digital repositories Mofor Source and Digimore. Segmentations of microCT and histological data were created using 3D Slicer, Horos, and Reconstruct software. 3D model repairs, sculpting, and additional modifications were created in ZBrush, Cinema 4D, and MeshLab. The wireframes, storyboards, 2D illustrations, and user interface elements were created using Adobe Illustrator, Photoshop, and the iPad application Procreate. The interactive module was created and coded in Adobe Animate using HTML5 and published using WordPress. The optimized 3D models were imported into C4D for lighting, materials, and keyframing. The 3D render frames were added to Adobe After Effects for compositing, labels, and audio. The results of this project included an interactive educational module containing a 3D overview animation and 72 assets, including 2D illustrations, icons, buttons, and annotations. Data derived 3D models include six models for the overview animation and four available on Sketchfab. I will now play my overview animation. The big brown bat, or Eptesicus fuscus, is an auditory specialist with a broad hearing range and high sensitivity to ultrasonic signals used for echolocation. The house mouse, or mus musculus, is an auditory generalist with a comparatively limited hearing range. There are remarkable variations in cochlear structure between these two species. 
The cochlea is a fluid-filled coil of the inner ear located in the petrous portion of the temporal bone. The apex of the cochlear spiral points rostrally towards the mandible, while the base points towards the external ear to receive sound vibrations. The cochlea transforms sound waves into electrical signals for processing in the brain. It is attached to the semicircular canals, which record the angular velocity of head movements to maintain balance. Inside the cochlea, different sound frequencies stimulate sensory hair cells along the basilar membrane. Lower frequency sounds stimulate hair cells in the apex, and higher frequency sounds stimulate hair cells in the base. The length of the coil of the big brown bat is approximately 6 to 7 millimeters, compared to that of the mouse, which is approximately 5 millimeters. The extra half turn of the big brown bat cochlea supports a broader hearing range. Studying comparative cochlear anatomy can aid in understanding auditory specializations and hearing loss in mammals. I will now show a demo of the interactive module. On the home screen, the user can enter the module. Under the cochlear anatomy button are secondary pages that detail the inner structures of the cochlea. The annotations on the cochlea section and organ of Porto pages reveal information about the members of structures. Under the normal versus deaf bat button are pages for damage data and damage mapping information. Under the overview animation page is a link to the animation housed on YouTube. These interactive models are educational tools available to the public on Sketchfab. These models allow the user to see the cochlea and skulls from various views, aiding with spatial learning and structural relationships. My results address the needs for an interactive comparative cochlea educational resource focused on the big brown bat and mouse. A workflow for future biocommunication projects involving animation, an interactive module for teaching comparative anatomy. The interactive is linked to the Liar Lab website. The animation can be found on YouTube with closed captions. The interactive models are available on Sketchfab. All the results are also available on my website. Variation in micro CT data resolution created artifacts and loss of geometry within this cochlea of each species. The segmentation of multiple bat and mouse specimen aided in the repairs in ZBrush and C4D through structure comparison. Meetings with the Lauer Lab were held to provide feedback on navigation, accessibility of content, and the organization of interactive module. This ensured content was presented in an engaging way for the user. Future directions include additional bat and mouse 3D interactive models of the middle ear ossicles, sagittal cut of the cochlea with membrane structures, and the organ of port teeth, and an additional interactive model of an adult human cochlea, as well as formal testing could provide user feedback. In conclusion, the results of this project provide a didactic and accessible visualization of comparative cochlea anatomy with an interactive module 3D animation, and interactive models. Thank you to Amanda Lauer, my preceptor, for helping me navigate through a complex structure, your enthusiasm, and your support throughout this project. Thank you to Lydia Gregg for all the encouragement, guidance, and patience. A special thank you to Madison Weinberg and the Lauer Lab the Department of Mechanical Engineering and the Department of Pediatrics at Johns Hopkins University and the Pound Human Identification Laboratory at the University of Florida, the Vesalius Trust for Visual Communication and Health Sciences for their generous support, to all the faculty and staff at the Arts Applied to Medicine for their knowledge and skills necessary to complete this project. Thank you to my family and to my classmates of 2020 for your friendship, laughter, and support. Thank you for watching. I encourage any questions or comments and would appreciate any feedback.
Hello, my name is Helen Tang, and today I am pleased to share with you my master's thesis, Personalizing Hospital-Based Stroke Education, Designing a Novel Recovery App to Prepare Stroke Patients for the Transition Home. Every 40 seconds, someone in the United States has a stroke. This cerebrovascular disease is a leading cause of disability, and its effects are multifaceted and unique to each patient. After spending an average of five days in the hospital, 50% of patients are discharged home to manage care independently, and follow-up care with the stroke clinic may not occur for weeks or months. Current hospital-based education consists of fleeting verbal instruction given by multiple care team members and comprehensive written handouts stapled into one thick stack. These methods overwhelm patients who during this challenging time are often forgetful, emotionally distressed, lose or don't read the handouts, and leave the hospital without learning key information needed for continued recovery and secondary prevention. To address these shortcomings, I collaborated with the multidisciplinary team at Johns Hopkins Hospital's Comprehensive Stroke Center to design a mobile app for patients and their care partners to use during the first days to weeks after stroke. The goal was to better prepare them for the new difficulties they face in the transition going from hospital to home. I used a bottom-to-top approach of user-centered design to create an app fundamentally focused on fulfilling the unmet needs of stroke patients. This required investigating two key questions. What resources already exist and who are stroke patients? I discovered numerous existing products and services across the realms of rehabilitation, education, and social support in the forms of websites, pamphlets, rehabilitation devices, podcasts, educational videos, and mobile apps. The unmet need was a resource that would help patients discover and prioritize these resources. Secondly, who are stroke patients? Through primary and secondary research, I found that the identity of stroke survivors and their information needs are highly diverse, depending on stroke severity, risk factors, medical history, life situation, and personal attitudes. I created five user personas to capture this diversity, which further underscored the need for a personalized resource in the challenging time following stroke. Using an iterative workflow, I designed a series of interactive prototypes that demonstrate the key features of an app serving as this personalized resource. I'll use these prototypes to give you a tour of the app. During the onboarding process for a first time user, this cartoon character I named Sunny sets an empathic tone and introduces four key features of the app. Personalized education, improved patient provider communication, actionable recovery goals, and progress tracking. After creating an account, the patient completes a first-time user questionnaire, which gathers basic information to begin content personalization. The patient inputs their gender, age, date, and type of stroke, and general areas affected. They are also asked if they would like to share access with a care partner. After account setup, we see the daily check-in screen. Both first-time and returning users opening the app for the first time each day will see this screen. The purpose of daily check-in is for patients to log stroke-related emotional and physical symptoms once a day. This is valuable because the effects of stroke evolve over time and patients may discover unique symptom patterns that they can share with their providers.
Optional daily reminders encourage regular usage. The home screen is the central location for bite-sized, personalized content. Each day, the patient is shown a motivational quote from a fellow stroke survivor, three personalized recovery exercises, and three personalized learning modules. In the backdrop are progress counters. As the patient engages with these modules, their achievements are recorded and celebrated. From the home screen, the patient can press the log button to complete daily check-in or record an appointment, note, question, test, or goal. In this case, the patient already completed the check-in, so a summary of their previous entry is shown. Storage of such information allows patients to better contextualize their early post-stroke experiences. The patient can retrieve saved questions from notifications to ask providers and record answers at a time convenient for them. The library is the central storage location for all learning modules, which are categorized to help patients efficiently locate specific resources. Within the rehabilitation section, a basics trailer introduces the patient to what rehabilitation is and how it works. Personalized focus areas are then displayed above other topic areas. Trouble swallowing, or dysphagia, is a common post-stroke complication that was prototyped as an example. The patient is invited to set a big goal, for example, eating dinner with their family. Having this personal long-term goal may motivate patients to perform the smaller daily goals. The logging feature Rehab was designed for therapists to record and share the patient's progress in specific areas affected by stroke. In this example, the patient has oral dysphagia. The therapist records the patient's current and goal levels for consuming different food consistencies. They can also assign exercises for patients to do. This way, the patient can view therapy goals and progress notes that are otherwise not accessible to them. Still to be prototyped are progress and calendar, which will function to display stored information back to patients in a meaningful way. Underlying the prototypes, I created an information architecture flowchart to show the overall structure and navigation of the app. Additionally, I included a diagram for progressive personalization to explain how user interaction drives the degree of content personalization. Together, the prototypes, information architecture, and strategy for personalization are being used to develop the first iteration of the app, which will be evaluated by the multidisciplinary team and beta tested by a subset of patients at Johns Hopkins Hospital. The assets I created are flexible and can easily be modified to accommodate changing project constraints and new insights. Additional time, funding, and human resources will be needed to continue iterating and implementing the designs. User-centered design provides a framework for innovating educational solutions that directly address the specific learning needs of each stroke patient. While I use this methodology specifically to design a stroke recovery app, it can also be applied to create apps for other chronic diseases, including heart failure and diabetes. This fundamentally patient-centered app has the potential to empower patients with knowledge, motivate them during the early recovery period, and improve overall outcomes.
In an era of personalized health care, such technology is essential to the patient's success. I would like to thank Dr. Mona Behuth, Corey Sandone, and Rachel Fabian Mace, whose time, knowledge, and support made this project possible. And thank you, the viewers, for joining me today. Hello, everyone. My name is Jenny Wang, and I'm a Master's of Art candidate in Medical and Biological Illustration. I'll be presenting from Baltimore, Maryland. My master's thesis is titled, Optimizing E-Learning in Genetics, Creating and Comparing Three Types of Multimedia. For this project, I work with the JHU Online Genetic Assistant Training Program, which is an online certificate program designed to provide genetics knowledge and skills to current or aspiring genetic assistants. The program wanted animations to be created for difficult to understand topics taken from student surveys. We chose to animate Understanding a Genetic Pedigree based on student feedback and took this opportunity to create an online study testing different aspects of animation alongside the current PowerPoint lecture video. Literature review showed that e-learning, or online learning, is a rapidly growing field. In 2017, 33% of higher education students in the United States took at least one online course. Animation is a large component of this field, as it makes use of the visual and auditory features of online education. However, contradicting studies exist regarding the use of animation. Some studies advocate that animation is the best modality for teaching scientific topics, and some studies have shown that animations actually increase cognitive load. We would like to analyze these contradictions further. We're not aware of any studies that focus on video comparison within genetics e-learning. The target audience of our study consists of potential students of the Online Genetics Assistant Training Program at Johns Hopkins University consisting of adult high school and college graduates who have taken some science courses. Our first goal was to create three videos on the topic of understanding a genetic pedigree for comparison. The first video is a PowerPoint video based on the current training program lectures. These videos are PowerPoint lectures with a floating head in the bottom right corner. The second video is a whiteboard animation, which virtually mocks a hand drawing on a whiteboard. The action of drawing is the only animated part of the video. The third video is a traditional animation, which is a 2D flat vector animation with animated characters and graphics. Our second goal was participant evaluation and statistical analysis. We determined the retention and engagement value of each type of video, as well as the time and effort spent creating each asset. Our first step was to simplify parts of the program curriculum to create a script on understanding a pedigree. We then diverged into three asset creation methods. The PowerPoint video was created by stitching together video segments from the program curriculum that matched our script. Extraneous information on slides were edited out. The whiteboard animation was created in Procreate and Adobe After Effects using the Auto Whiteboard plugin to mimic on-screen drawing by reverse masking pre-drawn images. The traditional animation was created in Adobe Illustrator and animated in After Effects. I used the Duic Basil plugin to rig characters and Animation Composer to create seamless transitions. Next, I will show 20 second clips of the three videos tested in this study. There are some basic shapes that we use to describe and or represent people on a pedigree. The first one is a circle. Circle is a woman or a girl, female. A ma uh, square is a man, boy, so that's a male. And a diamond can represent, if we don't know the gender, or maybe we're gonna group multiple people together that are males and females. We can use a diamond for that. Geneticists follow conventional rules when drawing a pedigree. A circle represents a female. A square represents a male. A diamond is used when the sex is unknown, or it could represent multiple people. Geneticists follow conventional rules when drawing a pedigree. A circle represents a female. A square represents a male. A diamond is used when the sex is unknown, or it could represent multiple people. 
Now I'll talk about our study design. For the participant evaluation aspect of our study, we received IRB approval for exempt research studies involving human subjects to gather anonymized survey responses. We used Amazon Mechanical Turk or MTurk for participant recruitment. MTurk is a crowdsourcing site where compensated online participants complete tasks for researchers. We used Qualtrics to survey participant responses. Our sample size was 168, split into three groups. Each group watched one type of video in full and short clips of the other two videos, and the responses were recorded. All survey responses were returned within one week. Our survey flow consisted of a six-question pretest on the topic of genetics, followed by one video in full. We then ran a quantitative survey on how engaging the full video was using three variables how much they enjoy the video, how much attention they pay to the video, and how well they understood the video. A post-test with identical questions was given to measure how much the participant learned from the video. Then, we screened the rest of the videos as short one-minute clips. The participant was then surveyed on how engaging the two short clips were. We subtracted the pre-test score from the post-test score from each participant to measure the amount they learned from watching a full video. We then measured the average of those score differences across three videos shown here. We did not find a significant difference in retention between the three videos. In other words, the data does not show that people learn better from one video over another in our study. Next, we have a chart describing the average engagement scores from participants who watched full videos. Each color represents a different variable of engagement, enjoyment, attention, and understanding. There was a significant difference between both animations compared to the PowerPoint video. However, we did not find a significant difference for any of the engagement scores between the two animations. Next, we have a chart describing the average engagement scores from the same participants who viewed short clips. There was also a significant difference between the animations and PowerPoint format. Again, there was no significant difference between the two animations. We measured the amount of effort each video took to create as well. The total creation time for the PowerPoint video is estimated to be around 4 hours. Each animation was around 6 minutes and 40 seconds in length. From storyboarding to post-processing, the whiteboard animation took 61 hours to complete, while the traditional animation took 167 hours. Therefore, since the retention measurements were not significantly different, choosing PowerPoint lecture over animations is optimal for smaller budgets. However, because there may be a subsequent loss in engagement due to the format of the PowerPoint lecture, animation should be considered to maintain learner engagement. Studies have shown that engagement is critical to elicit and maintain learner attention, especially for longer segments. Motivation to commit mental resources to learning increases as the learner is more engaged. After we compiled all our findings together, we can see that the retention did not vary significantly between the three video types. Both animations fared significantly better on engagement scores than the PowerPoint video. Finally, production speed is fastest creating a PowerPoint video and slowest creating a traditional 2D animation. This project was able to provide some insight into retention and engagement values across three types of media in the context of genetics. However, future studies are recommended to determine when animation should be used as a teaching method within other contexts, as learner engagement and retention may differ based on style and animated topic. With more time and funding, some future study developments could include recreating the PowerPoint lecture video from scratch instead of compiling clips together from an existing curriculum, aligning the script and pacing of the PowerPoint video with the other animations would reduce confounding variables that could affect learner response. We could also calculate the specific amount of time required to create a tailored PowerPoint video. Another future plan could be increasing the sample size for greater resolution to our findings. We plan on submitting this abstract to professional conferences and educational journals in the near future. 
This thesis would not have been possible without the support and guidance of many individuals. I would like to thank my preceptor, Dr. Ada Hamash, my faculty advisor, Dr. Jeff Day, and my content advisors, Carolyn, Kelsey, and Lindsay. A special thank you to many others for providing your resources and encouragement throughout this project. Your support has been tremendous. Hello everyone and welcome. My name is William Guzman Jr. and I am a medical and biological illustration Master of Arts candidate enrolled in the Department of Art as Applied to Medicine. I will be presenting my thesis depicting a novel proposed pathway for prostate cancer precursor lesion development using 3D animation. The prostate is a small walnut sized organ that rests between the base of the penis and the bladder. The image on the left is a 3D model of the prostate in anatomical orientation. The prostate is composed of fibrous tissue, muscular tissue, and complex networks of ducts known as glands. Here in the image on the right, we can appreciate the gland anatomy in detail. Prostate cancer is one of the most common cancers among men. Luminal epithelial cells have been regarded as the cell of origin of prostate cancer. Recent evidence suggests that prostate cancer may be attributed to both bacterial infection and chronic inflammation, which can lead to gene fusion events between a normally expressed gene that codes for transmembrane protease serine 2, tempers 2, and erythroblastosis virus E26 oncogene homologue, ERG, a gene that codes for an oncoprotein. Typically, normal healthy luminal cells do not express the ERG oncogene, but in about 50% of prostate cancer cases, the ERG gene is fused with tempers 2 which causes cells to express ERG, and may lead to the formation of lesions known as proliferative inflammatory atrophy, PIA. Specifically staining for ERG allows us to appreciate the production and presence of this oncoprotein, which strongly supports this hypothesis. Precursor lesion development is studied through 2D sections in the microscope slides. The prostate is sliced into several sections and further prepared for histological analysis. Viewing the formation of this multidimensional development process through microscope slides is challenging as it is impossible to see the pathway in action. Even with all the different modalities of studying the prostate, most of what we know is largely attributed by looking at still sections. Figure A displays the slicing process to create sections of prostate tissue in order to be further prepared in figure B to become a histological slide. This limits the researchers to only portraying 2D data when presenting new findings. The first goal of this thesis was to effectively communicate the complexity of recent evidence to graduate students and researchers outside of the prostate oncology field. The second goal was to produce an animation. Histology was translated into an animation because this is easily understood by those who are not used to looking at cancer solely through the microscope. The key concepts emphasized in the animation were the cellular interactions between the inflammatory cells, bacteria, and luminal epithelial cells. Resources and visual references provided were existing microscopy datasets which included high-resolution scanning electron microscope imaging. Histology data from 15 radical prostatectomy specimens was also provided by the Sphanos lab and was accessed using Procia, a pathology viewing software. For the creation of the animation, I used the following software, Cinema 4D, Redshift, Adobe After Effects, Adobe Audition, Adobe Photoshop, ZBrush, and Procia. A script was first developed to establish the word choice and pacing of the final animation. After, storyboards were created to be used as visual reference for the scenes that matched the script. Finally, the script and storyboards were stitched together to create a 2D animation known as an animatic. I will now play the final animation created for this project. Prostate cancer is one of the most common malignant neoplasms among men in Western countries. 
The only known risk factors for prostate cancer are advanced age, family history, and African ancestry. Genetics, diet, and other lifestyle-related factors may also play a role. Recently, chronic inflammation has been linked to the growth and development of several solid cancers and may contribute to prostate carcinogenesis. Studying the histology of the prostate offers pathologists valuable insights into the possible pathogenesis of prostate cancer. Within the prostate are small compound tubular alveolar ducts known as prostatic glands. These glands are made of pseudostratified columnar luminal epithelial cells and simple squamous basal cells surrounded by a stroma of connective tissue and smooth muscle. In a normal prostate, the glandular luminal epithelial cells have very low cellular turnover and rarely proliferate. Inflammation in the prostate is associated with the development of proliferative inflammatory atrophy, PIA, a proposed precursor lesion to prostate cancer development. Unlike normal prostatic epithelial cells, luminal cells involving PIA have high cellular turnover and are highly proliferative. As foreign bacteria invade the glands, immune cells such as neutrophils, macrophages, and monocytes quickly begin to populate the lumen and release cytokines. This inflammatory state drives immune cells to produce reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species that may cause DNA damage and DNA breaks. In addition, the invading bacteria can produce genotoxins such as colobactin, present in E. coli, that may also induce DNA damage in luminal epithelial cells. When inflammatory oxidants and or bacterial genotoxins leads to DNA breaks, abnormal gene fusions may result. Transmembrane protease serine 2, TEMPRS2, is a protein regularly expressed and driven by androgen receptor signaling within the luminal cells of the prostate. Along the same chromosomal strand of DNA is a gene for erythroblastosis virus E26 oncogene homolog, ERG, a known oncogene. In normal functioning luminal epithelial cells, ERG is not expressed. However, recent evidence has shown that in about 50% of prostate cancer cases in the US, the promoter region of the TEMPRS2 gene has become fused to the coding region of the ERG gene, causing cells to express the ERG oncoprotein. It is hypothesized that genomic damage caused by infections and inflammation promote the formation of the TEMPRS2 ERG gene fusion, possibly playing a very early and not yet well understood role in the development of prostate cancer. The ERG expressing cells replicate and displace the ERG negative luminal epithelial cells in the PIA lesion. These atrophic cells release pro inflammatory cytokines and other acute inflammatory proteins to further increase immune cell count within the glands. At some point, perhaps with the acquisition of additional genomic and or epigenomic alterations, these ERG expressing cells invade the basement membrane. Once the luminal cells infiltrate the stroma, the basal cells are no longer maintained, and the ERG expressing cells are now consistent with prostate adenocarcinoma. The animation will be viewable on my website, Plasma Visuals, and on the Spanos Laboratory website. This animation will be part of a research paper that is in the final stages of preparation, for which I will be a co-author. Some future considerations for the project include exploring other cellular processes that also contribute to prostate cancer, and the development of a subpage within the Spanos Lab website that will host an interactive model of prostate cancer. I would like to thank Karen Svanos, my preceptor, the researchers in the Svanos lab, Tim Phelps, my faculty advisor, and David Rainey, my technical advisor, for their constant support and guidance throughout the completion of this project. I would also like to give a warm thank you to the faculty and staff in the Department of Art as Applied to Medicine, my classmates in the class of 2020, and the first years. I now encourage any feedback, questions, or comments.
Hello, my name is Kellen Sanders and I am a Master's of Arts candidate in Medical and Biological Illustration. This is my presentation on my master's thesis, 3D Reconstruction of Fossilized Skull of South American Miocene Monkey Homunculus Patagonicus, an Augmented Reality for Field Application. For most Miocene taxa, primate fossil evidence consists of broken cranial bones, teeth, and jaws. Studying these fossils is difficult due to the damage and distortion during geological stress. During fossilization, the soft tissue is seldom preserved. Homunculus patagonicus is an unusual primate from the Miocene epoch around 17 million years ago of extreme southern Argentina. To reconstruct the diet of such extinct mammals, the jaws, skull, and muscles of mastication provide insight into how food properties influence skull morphology over evolutionary time. The image on the right shows where the extant or living range of primates are in South America in comparison to where the homunculus patagonicus fossils are being found in orange. One of the problems with bringing extinct animals to life for teaching, research, and public understanding is the incompleteness and distortion that characterizes nearly every fossil specimen. Even the best specimens are fragments, deformed, and or missing parts due to the ravages of the fossilization process. Current teaching materials rely on simplistic line diagrams and photographs, which do not allow for detail of bony landmarks and delicate muscle fiber orientations. Digital resources such as three-dimensional, 3D anatomical learning applications are, at present, limited to human and canine anatomy. A 3D application for teaching extinct primate anatomy has never been attempted. This project allows the use of comparative anatomy to learn how homunculus patagonicus lived and its relationship to its environment through an examination of dietary adaptations. The goals of my thesis were to complete a digital 3D model of the reconstructed cranium and mandible from the CT data, digital 3D jaw adductor muscle models, including origins and insertions based on extant analogs, a fully interactive iOS application, and finally a reproducible workflow documenting steps from CT data acquisition, digital reconstruction, and creation of the application. The primary audience for this application is scientific colleagues, PhD, graduate, and undergraduate students conducting research on primatology and mammalian evolutionary biology. The secondary audience is a broader interested public, and the tertiary audience is clinicians for use in comparative approaches for pre-surgical planning. For the materials and methods, we will go through data acquisition and processing, the cranium reconstruction, muscle reconstruction, origins and insertions, and the 3D iOS application development. During the data acquisition and processing, a micro CT scan of homunculus patagonicus fossil was acquired and segmented using Dragonfly ORS. Sediment remained after segmentation inside the cranium and needed to be manually removed using Cinema 4D. The turntable on the right displays how much sediment remained inside of the skull. During the reconstruction process, reduction of the distortion in the cranium was accomplished by referencing other specimens of the same species as well as extant models. For the first time, we can observe the skull of this species without the bias of distortion. During the muscle reconstruction, chewing muscles were completed after the cranium reconstruction using the visible muscle scars on the skull and mandible. Muscle volumes were estimated using equations from extant South American monkeys. The chart to the right shows the muscle volume estimates. Muscle scars on bony surfaces of the skull and mandible were used to map the origins and insertions of each muscle. A in the image on the right shows the temporalis muscle origin in orange and the insertion in teal. B shows the masseter and C shows the medial pterygoid. Wireframes were created in Adobe Illustrator and then built in Unity as a user interface. Each section was designed and coded for while reusing the Illustrator design elements as sprites. My thesis resulted in CT data fossil model, reconstructed fossil model, muscle reconstruction models, extant distribution map, a phylogenetic tree, an iOS application built in Unity, and an animation demo. The digital fossil reconstruction of homunculus patagonicus 
occurred in multiple stages which allowed the specimen to be viewed for the first time as an average composite member of the species. We will go through the stages in detail. In the first stage, the manual sediment removal followed by the reorientation and alignment of fragments occurred to make the specimen as anatomically correct as possible. The second stage resulted in this digital restoration that filled in the missing anatomy and fragments. The reconstructed anatomy can be seen in dark brown and the original fossil CT data in light brown. The third stage resulted in a fully reconstructed digital model of Homunculus pedagonicus with as many data preserved as possible to showcase details of the bony landmarks and muscle attachment sites. The volumetric data were then used to create digital muscle models that attach to the cranium and the mandible of the reconstructed fossil. The muscles were constructed using their origin and insertion sites. The origin and insertion for each muscle group are seen here. The orange represents the muscle origins and the teal represents the muscle insertions. The fully interactive iOS application was created featuring the 3D reconstructed models with augmented reality, original CT data, distribution maps of extant primates including the phylogenetic tree and fossil distribution map, and a placeholder animation. Now we will see the demo of my application and its different sections. The goal of this project was to reconstruct, for the first time, the missing anatomy of a complete fossil specimen of Homunculus patagonicus. This reconstruction will provide a publicly accessible resource for researchers, students, and the interested public to view and learn about the specimen. The iOS application will be available from the Apple App Store and will allow access to everything seen in the demo. During the project, one of the challenges was the manual removal of sediment. The CT data provided were so impacted with sediment that the osteological details were impossible to visualize. Sediment inside of the skull created millions of polygons that did not allow the functions needed in ZBrush to complete the reconstruction. For this reason, it was necessary to spend a considerable amount of time removing the sediment manually in Cinema 4D by selecting groups of sediment individually and deleting them. A second challenge was the muscle reconstruction. Originally, the medial pterygoid volume estimate was 0.6 cubic centimeters. When this volume was used, the muscle was so small that it could not be extended between its origin and insertion. With this finding, Dr. Perry used comparative measures to recalculate a volume that would allow for a more proportional volumetric relationship to the temporalis group and masseter group. This new estimate was 1.3 cubic centimeters, which compared favorably to the data in Slade 2018. While more information is still needed to infer a specific diet, the reconstruction did provide visual verification that the dimensional data were realistic for the temporalis and masseter groups. For future inferences to be made on the diet, the specimen's heavy toothware will be taken into consideration. I would like to thank my preceptor, Dr. Perry, my faculty advisor, Jennifer Fairman, Sarah Poynton for helping during the Vesalius Trust and thesis presentations, Kyle Erickson for helping get my app working correctly, Vesalius Trust for awarding me a Vesalian scholarship, and my art as applied to medicine faculty, staff, and students.
Hi there, my name is Morgan Summerlin. I'm a Master of Arts candidate in Medical and Biological Illustration, and this is my presentation on my master's thesis. My thesis investigated encouraging HIV-positive organ transplantation using novel modular animations. So this is a representation of the organ donor pool in the United States before the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s. During the epidemic, highly infectious HIV was rapidly spreading through segments of the U.S. population. As a protective measure, the government prohibited the use of organs from people with HIV and organ transplantation. Today, however, someone with HIV under continuous use of HIV medicines can live a long and healthy life with essentially no risk of transmitting HIV. People with HIV on the organ waitlist face an increased risk of dying and lowered access to transplantation. Fortunately, the HOPE Act of 2013 reversed this outdated ban, which provides more organs for people with HIV on the waitlist. Despite this great change, transplants are not reaching their maximum potential of 300 to 500 deceased donors every year. This is because of a lack of awareness in the public incomplete implementation of HOPE Act policy in the transplant system, and lingering HIV stigma in the organ donation system. This is because there is insufficient visual outreach material to educate a variety of audiences. People living with HIV, trauma center nurses that recommend patients for organ donation, organ procurement organizations that screen potential donors, national transplant centers, infectious disease physicians, and patients with HIV on the waitlist who are considering receiving an organ from a donor with HIV. The most essential audiences were identified. The largest losses of potential donors is from people living with HIV not being aware that they can become organ donors, and that nurses and OPO representatives may not be referring patients with HIV for donation because of a preconceived stigma against HIV. The first goal of this project was to explain the HOPE Act and the biological risks of HIV-positive transplantation in a novel modular animation workflow. The second was to produce two standalone animations created from reusable and unique call-to-action clips that address the two critical audiences. Each animation consisted of reusable introduction, body, and conclusion clips, with a unique call-to-action clip tacked on at the end that addresses each audience on what they can do to help. A script was developed with language comfortable for both audiences, both patients and those in healthcare. The script was mostly written at the patient level, however, certain higher level medical terms were used, such as HIV superinfection. Additionally, someone with an HIV infection should be referred to with person first language as a person living with HIV. Using terminology specific to patients with HIV will help to prepare those in the organ donation system to communicate with these patients. When discussing organ transplantation in the community of people living with HIV, we explored representational and metaphorical storytelling. The following system of icons was developed to visually differentiate donors and recipients both with and without HIV. The first animation created for this project encouraged people living with HIV to consider registering to be an organ donor, and the second asks nurses and OPO representatives to consider all patients equally when referring patients for donation regardless of HIV status. I will now present the animation addressed to people living with HIV. Nearly 114,000 people in the United States are currently in need of an organ transplant. Every day, over 100 people are added to the waitlist, and 20 will die having never received the life-saving transplant they needed. A growing number of those waiting are also living with HIV and are more likely to die waiting for a transplant. In the past, organs from donors with HIV were considered unsafe and were banned from use in transplantation. Historically, people with HIV received organ donations from people without HIV. However, studies show that they can also receive organs from people with HIV with equally successful outcomes the HIV Organ Policy Equity Act, or HOPE Act, was passed in 2013 and legalized transplanting organs from donors with HIV to people who also have HIV. Thanks to the HOPE Act, people in need of an organ are more likely to receive a transplant. 
Transplanting organs between donors and recipients with HIV provides more organs for people without HIV and creates more life-saving transplants every year. How is it possible that patients with HIV can receive organs from donors who also have HIV? HIV is a virus that primarily infects the body's white blood cells. The virus enters a host cell where it makes copies of itself using the host cell's machinery. As it replicates, HIV has the ability to mutate and change over time, which creates unique strains of HIV that can differ from person to person. The virus then leaves the cell to locate a new host and continue its life cycle. HIV medicines work by blocking replication and preventing the spread of HIV to other cells, which minimizes levels of HIV in the body. Decades of research into HIV medicines has allowed HIV to become a controlled condition rather than a deadly disease. However, when HIV mutates, it can become resistant to medication. Fortunately, there are multiple classes of HIV medicines that block HIV replication in different ways. If HIV becomes resistant to one class of medicines, others can be substituted to control an HIV infection. When someone with HIV is given an organ from a donor with HIV, new strains of the virus can be introduced with the organ. Fortunately, the recipient's current HIV medicines are likely to control the new strains from the donor. However, the recipient could become infected with the new strains in addition to their existing HIV infection. This is called superinfection. If superinfection occurs, different HIV medicines will be tried until an effective new combination is found. Fortunately, studies show that the risk of superinfection is low compared to the greater risk of dying while waiting for an organ. Organ transplantation between donors and recipients with HIV is an important step towards shortening the waitlist for organ transplants. Under the HOPE Act, 500 to 600 new donors are expected to be available in the U.S. annually, and up to 10,000 people with HIV could benefit from this change. Your support and participation can help maximize these life-saving transplants. We ask that you consider registering to be an organ donor because that one decision could save lives. Register at the DMV or online at registerme.org and talk to your friends and family to make your decision about organ donation known. You do not have to disclose your HIV status in order to register. We also ask that you help raise awareness of the importance of organ donation in the community of people living with HIV to continue these life-saving transplants. The animations were created for reusable introduction, body, and conclusion clips, as well as call-to-action clips that were customized to each audience. When shared with the intended audiences, they are expected to decrease HIV stigma in donor referrals and encourage participation in HIV-positive transplantation. The remaining clips for the other target audiences may be completed to maximize outreach, and the animations will be shared at various venues, including HIV clinics and the meetings I have listed here. In the future, a pre- and post-test may be administered to test the effectiveness of educational aspects of the animations. I'd like to thank my advisor, David Reaney, in the Department of Art as Applied to Medicine, my preceptors, Dr. Christine Duran and Dr. Doris Segev, and Brianna Doby from the Hope in Action team. Thank you for your attention, and I hope you've learned about how the Hope Act has brought positive change to the community of people living with HIV. Hello, my name is Noelle Burgess. I am a Master of Arts candidate in Medical and Biological Illustration at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. This is my presentation on my master's thesis project. The thesis project was creating a game-based learning tool for optimizing intrahospital disaster response. A mass casualty incident, or MCI, is classified as any traumatic event in which medical resources are overwhelmed by the number and severity of casualties. 
MCI can be of both natural and man-made origin and are of increasing concern to the medical sector. Examples of such MCI events include natural disasters, terrorism, mass transportation accidents, and one we are too familiar with at the moment, pandemics. MCI causes a sudden surge or influx of patients interacting with the medical system. This surge presents a logistical challenge that requires rapid adaptation and coordination between many different medical disciplines. In such events, resources are strained in three major categories, space, staff, and medical supplies. MCI emergency plans are already in place in the majority of the United States hospital system. However, gaps in knowledge have been identified amongst intra-hospital staff. MCI presents an extreme logistical challenge. This challenge requires that all intra-hospital personnel fully understand their responsibilities in such an event in order to prioritize patient care and manage finite quantities of space, staff, and supplies to save lives. This means training for intra-hospital employees is a necessity. Current training methods include a combination of digital training modules and large hospital-wide simulations. Both training methods have their merits. However, each has shortcomings as well, particularly in areas of learner engagement, cost, and repeatability. As a remedy to these shortcomings, the use of a game as a training delivery device was proposed. Game-based learning has a few distinct advantages. It increases learner engagement, provides a space for in-person team-based decision-making, and a safe simulated environment through which to learn and practice material. During concept generation of our MCI learning game, we determined a need for three major outcomes the learning of pertinent medical information and hospital management protocol, as well as practicing or application of these concepts through teamwork and complex decision-making. And it would need to do all this in such a way that was accessible to a multidisciplinary suite of intra-hospital personnel. Due to the novel nature of applying game-based learning to hospital disaster protocol, we chose to use what is referred to as the spiral model of iterative design. Essentially, this means that we went through several repetitive prototyping cycles in which we plan, design or prototype, test, identify problems, and then reevaluate before cycling through the process again. Over the course of development, we generated a rule set, facilitator script, audio files to aid in the creation of an immersive environment, and of course the physical board game elements. Key considerations in the creation of the storyline and visuals included. How do we get the game participant to feel invested in the role they are playing? How do we get participants to work as a team to make decisions about how to manage space, staff, and medical supplies? How do we represent the passage of time and the subsequent stress on the individual, team, and hospital? To create an immersive environment in this first version of the game, we chose to make our simulated mass casualty incident a mass shooting at a food truck rally in a nearby park. On the whole, we completed one prototype where we ironed out game introduction and core elements, a second prototype where we tested the first round of the game and introduced the concept of triage. A third prototype where we introduced all planned game elements and their corresponding visuals. And a fourth prototype where we continued to refine game visuals and confirmed participant ability to progress through all six rounds of gameplay. During these preliminary prototyping cycles, we used my classmates as a user testing group. Thanks, guys. Our final round of testing was done with individuals from our target audience. After each round of prototyping and user testing, product refinements were made, spurring us toward our final product. Here is the result of all this cumulative effort. When creating the visual elements, attention was paid to the color story to ensure that the game looked engaging and fun, without seeming inappropriate in light of the game's content. A dusty blue was chosen to represent normal hospital operations, 
In contrast, yellow correlated with the hospital critical event codes. ED code yellow and hospital code yellow correspond with patient influx events. Finally, a vibrant orange was chosen to represent player actions. Illustrations were created to support the simulation storyline, add visual interest, and help players quickly identify key game elements. Care was taken to emulate MCI strain on resources as well. The rooms in the game board represent MCI strain on available space. Staff fatigue was represented through the finite supply of player action cards. These cards also represented player moves and varied by job description. Strain on availability of medical supplies was represented through the limited quantity of supply cards. 60 patient triage cards were developed and their entry into gameplay was staged by round. The staging of arriving casualties helped to progress the game and emulated the order of casualty arrivals in a real event, with the less injured or ambulatory individuals arriving in the first 30 minutes, to be followed in later rounds by those requiring more urgent care, with a simulated arrival time of 60 to 90 minutes. Finally, in order to increase consistency between the delivery and facilitation of separate training events, a digital facilitator was conceived. A flowchart for this element was created with the intent of developing it in the future. Next steps include completion of the digital facilitator, investigation into the game's effect on staff MCI performance, the publication and distribution of the game to hospitals around the U.S., and the creation of additional scenarios, particularly for natural disaster, chemical spill, and epidemic. I learned a few important lessons about the gamification of instruction. For effective delivery, it is important to divide content into separate events that proceed in this order. Learn, practice, implement. It is important to do everything you can to reduce cognitive load. If you have too many tasks and or too many visual elements, you are going to overwhelm your learner and they won't be able to process the information you are trying to get them to understand. Finally, user testing is essential. Listening to the user will help you refine information, refine the amount and delivery of game elements, and refine gameplay itself to achieve the optimal experience. Finally, we are still looking for funding. We're writing grant applications to fund further development and looking to generate partnerships in order to register the product and license it. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who contributed to this project and supported me through my thesis research. And of course, thank you to my classmates for providing frequent, priceless feedback throughout the creation of this project. And thank you for watching. What amazing projects. Second years, thank you so much. We are so proud of you, and you should be very proud of yourselves because they looked fantastic. So thank you so much. So again, everybody on YouTube Live, I ask that you just relax for a minute or two, take a little break, and in the meantime, we'll get our question and answer session fired up on Zoom, and then I will feed the Zoom meeting into YouTube Live so that you can all listen to our students, get a chance to hear them answer a few questions. Thank you again for participating.
Okay, you guys are on YouTube Live. Okay, so I, I just want to start by saying again, uh, what an amazing collection of presentations and uh, having all of the preceptors or most of the preceptors and advisors uh, on at one time. I just, um, on behalf of all of the faculty, thank you so much for working with the students. They could not do it without you. Uh, they rely on your expertise and hopefully, like they do with us, push the envelope of, of what we know as well. And, and I hope and I'm sure they did the same thing with all of you. So um, preceptors, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend uh, five minutes uh, with each student for questions. And you saw the number of comments and questions coming in live through YouTube. So Daisha did an incredible job of trying to ferret through the nice comments and the questions. And we've been able to, um, to collect most of them. We won't get to all of them, but we'll do our very best. But um, first I want to ask, does anybody here live have comments on uh, Helen's pro project or questions? Um, hi, this is Mona Behoof. I was lucky enough to be Helen's preceptor. Um, I just want to say fantastic work, Helen. Um, I knew how hard you were working all year, um, but your presentation really encapsulated that beautifully. So um, kudos could not have been more beautiful. So thank you for all of your work all year and such a splendid presentation. Thank you, Mona. I'm sorry, I just clicked in, but is this when you want us to uh, ask any questions of Helen's presentation or? Yes, Mona, absolutely, please do. All right, well, Helen, you've had a chance to really observe a lot of stroke patients in a variety of settings. Um, and of course, with any piece of technology, um, adoption of that technology and use of it is really the critical um, critical feature. Will they use it or not? So what are your perceived top barriers to use of this beautiful app and what could we do about it to increase uptake of it specific to this population? Uh, so I think that there are two main barriers. Probably one would be the severity of stroke and the second would be what you mentioned is tech proficiency. Um, for the first thing, which is stroke severity, uh, the primary user in cases where the patient has a more, more severe deficits, at least to begin with, um, their care partner ideally would, would be the stand-in to track their progress and use the app uh, on their behalf until perhaps they've recovered functionally enough to use it themselves. For the other subset, um, I, I would emphasize that this app augments the existing resources. It's not meant to replace written and verbal resources. Um, and it would require a base level of tech profi proficiency to use, use this app. So um, it would be useful to have patient like vetted written resources as well for patients to use um, so that everyone is accommodated for as much as possible. And also having this app be multifunctional will allow someone to get something, everyone to get something out of the app. So that's my answer. Thank you. I thought I would just comment and say how impressed I was with how thorough the app was designed and um, your your thinking, in, um, you know, from the patient perspective and family perspective and just um, all the different facets of of the condition. Um, I, I thought it was well designed and, and kudos to you for such a thorough job on a, a very well designed and planned app. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be so comforting and patient-centric and uh, really met all the needs of somebody looking for knowledge. And uh, I loved all your characters, the simplicity behind the design, and uh, just it was really well done. Thanks, Jim. Your presentation was very, very elegant and creative in your transitions between information and slides. 
got to practice what you preach. <laughs> hey, Helen, great job. Uh, have you found that as you thought about user-centered design, does it approach how you look at other products? Uh, yeah, it does. There's a lot you can actually learn from commercials, actually. That's what I found. Sorry. Great. Great. Whoops. David, no. Can't hear you. All right, everybody. Sorry about that. I just had to run out of the room. So, Helen, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm so sorry, Jamie. You went first. And in all of you guys can't see this, but this is like a control room. And I um, jumped forward to Helen. So, my apologies, Jamie. So let's go back to uh, Jamie. Any further questions for Helen before we move on? Great. Beautiful job, Helen. Really, really well done. Thank you. Thank you. And now on to Jamie. Jamie, also a beautiful job. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Jamie? Hi, I do. I'm Amanda Lauer, um, and I was Jamie's preceptor. Jamie, that was really excellent presentation, and as you know, I really am thrilled with how the whole thesis turned out. I think it's going to be a really excellent educational tool for students in general and new people coming to the auditory system to use, but also, you know, we've had trouble um, conveying the deaf bat data in particular to the bat research community, so this is going to be, I think, very impactful. So my question for you, though, is what surprised you the most about something you learned about the bat and the mouse cochleas during all of this process, because this is such a different set of information than what you came to the lab having. Oh, yes. I learned so much during this project. Um, what was interesting is that comparing the bat to the mouse, the bat is actually a bit smaller than a mouse, the skull size is, but its cochlea is actually larger compared to the mouse. So since it has echolocation abilities, it makes sense that its cochlea would be a lot larger due to having special um, sensory hair cells. And it was really interesting to just learn the size differences between the two species. Jamie, you use so many different um, segmentation platforms yes. for your thesis. I was curious, um, do you have anything you could share with your classmates about um, maybe what, what is 3D Slicer good for compared to Oros or any any thoughts and reflections after all the work you've done there? Okay. Um, I definitely think that 3D Slicer is an amazing program to have available to you. I was surprised at how amazing it is that you can just paint any kind of segmentation for Mica CT data and turn it into a 3D model and have it ready to go. Um, and it was a good lesson to know how to get micro CT data available to me, as well as getting it into a segmentation uh, program such as Horos or 3D Slicer. And that there's other programs out there that you can also use for histological slides, such as Reconstruct and other programs too, that can help you build 3D models from data. Excellent job. It was really great working with you this year. Thank you, Lydia. Um, I wanted to just commend you on um, the amount of work that you've done. And also, I was really impressed with the fact that you continued on with Animate. Not a lot of people do that. And so, um, yeah, I just I just wanted to tell you how, how proud I am to see that you, you know, you just took it further, you pushed the project further. And it's, a, it's an excellent resource. And you already had someone on the AMI want to see that model. So that's great. Yes, it was um, amazing to see that my models are actually available to the public and they're actually helping people. So it's amazing to see your artwork in action and be available and useful. Yeah, the models were impressive. Thank you, Tim. Great. Jamie, thank you very much. Does anybody have any um, further questions for Jamie? Great. Um, I need to tell you that almost all of the feedback on YouTube Live, not many people ask questions. Most, most of them were just glowing, glowing comments. So most of the questions will come from this group, and that's fine. 
So next, let's go on to Jenny Wang. Jenny, you did a great job. Beautiful presentation. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions for Jenny? Uh, I'll start it off. I'm Jeff Day. I'm Jenny's faculty advisor. Unfortunately, uh, uh, her preceptor, Ada Hamash, has been having trouble getting onto the Zoom. Uh, so uh, I'll start it off. Oh, yeah, she can't sign on right now, sadly. And Jenny did get a few questions, so I don't want to take too long. But Jenny, great job with... Uh, your project management, uh, hurting all us cats. Um, Jenny had the added challenge of she had to get her assets done early um, in order to be able to run her test. And then she uh, was able to learn statistics from scratch, which was amazing uh, in order to get everything done. Um, so my question to you, Jenny, was um, you got to try some new animation techniques. Uh, you got to compare them with a the study. Uh, you got to run a study. Was there anything you found surprising or especially interesting? That's a great question, Jeff. Um, I think the most surprising thing for me was how efficient MTurk was um, to use as a data collection platform. And we were able to re uh, receive all our responses within the span of one week, um, which I assume is substantially faster than if we were to run a study in person. And it definitely reduces, you know, study costs and um, like a accommodation costs as well. So I think that was the most surprising thing definitely for me for this um, study. Cool. Jenny, I do have one question that came in through the YouTube Live. Uh, it says, AMT workers are paid. How do you mm -hmm. think this might affect engagement? Furthermore, did you add attention or manipulation checks to ensure people weren't uh, answering survey the survey randomly? Um, so our survey was estimated to be around 20 minutes in length, so we felt that um, the survey itself would be engaging enough to not have an attention check. Um, compensation definitely could have a potential impact on response, um, but many survey uh, studies involve compensation in order to survey a large amount of people, especially with like deadlines and you know um, that timeline that we had. Um, so, but participants were instructed to give their honest responses, and I think as a result, we got a lot of honest, use, usable feedback, so that was great. Uh, Jenny, uh, your preceptor, Ada, has submitted a question um, through Juan, I guess. She's asking whether you think that the splice nature of the PowerPoint presentation interfered with the enjoyment engagement ratings. I think definitely uh, it had an impact especially since um, the, uh, the splice nature made it kind of jarring to watch uh, for some users. So I think uh, a future a consideration could be to you know, create a tailored PowerPoint video from scratch um, in order to bypass those problems. This is Ada. I finally got in and I'm very sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. First of all, congratulations. It's really beautiful work and an extremely interesting study design. Um, I do wonder whether it's actually worth doing that tailored PowerPoint so that we can get valid results on whether the enjoyment was so significantly different. Um, you know, I, but I, I actually loved all your animations and we're going to use them regardless. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Marsh. Um, Jenny, uh, could I ask a quick question, Jenny? Yeah, of course. I was just curious about um, how your decision making for um, what variables to change between the uh, whiteboard versus traditional animation, uh, like color backgrounds and um, different factors that were changed. So that's definitely a difficult aspect of um, animation studies in general, because uh, there's so much effect that style and topic have on the outcome. Um, so I chose to use a hand-drawn style from the whiteboard and um, like a kind of 2D flat vector design, and I chose to stick with those. But I think we had our narration be the same for both and the script be the same for both. So we were able to kind of um, have some variables be the same. Um, yeah, did that answer your question? Or? To clarify, Jenny, uh, can you comment on some of the thought you put into the questions in, in eliciting specific differences? that you're testing for in the whiteboard and the uh, traditional animation? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, for the genetics pre-test and post-test uh, to measure retention, we had six questions in total. Two questions were measuring word recall. So um, we had um, participants see if they could 
draw out um, what was said in the video. So in the whiteboard video, there was a hand writing uh, what was being said, what was being narrated, but in the 2D animation, there was only the narration. So um, we had two questions measuring whether in the whiteboard animation, both narration and writing the answer out was more effective than um, the 2D animation. Um, but since our results were not st statistically significant, um, we weren't able to make a conclusion right then and there. So I think future studies, um, a future study design could be um, increasing the sample size to perhaps uh, get a better resolution for that specific question type. Great. Thank you so much, Jenny. Really appreciate it. Wonderful job. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to go on to William. William, beautiful presentation. Yay. Uh, Thank you. Does anybody have any comments or questions for William to get started? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Spanos, and I was William's preceptor for his project. And I would just like to say uh, congratulations, first and foremost, William. You did a wonderful job with um, your whole project and your presentation. Um, very, very impressive work. It's been amazing working with you um, and the animation that you made will certainly go to very good use, um, including in a publication that's getting ready to, to go out the door. So I really appreciate your very strong and wonderful work. And um, my question for you is pretty straightforward. I'm curious to know what was what was harder for you, uh, or what, what did you, you think was harder, learning all the science behind uh, prostate cancer and um, our <laughs> models for precursor lesions, or making the animation itself? Um, first of all, uh, thank you for, for all your support. Um, you, you really taught me a lot during this whole, um, during the completion of the project. Um, as for the difficulty of it, um, I had a, a good background since we had taken a pathology course, and um, through reading your papers, I understood it, but it was difficult to try to narrow that down to something that's easily digestible for the audience. So I think that's where the challenge came in, to try to make something so huge and complex uh, really easy to understand. You did a beautiful job. Thank you. <laughs> I was uh, William's uh, faculty advisor, and I want to congratulate you on just a superb uh, animation. It was great to work with you. You were organized. You had great time management, and I just I just think it was uh, really well done. Well, thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. Um, I'll say that um, kudos for the beautiful animation accompanied with great audio to sort of augment what I believe would be, be excellent learning. So really great choices. And I think your your models there could really work for a lot of diseases and teachable items. So great work. Thank you. William, there were also a lot of comments online about your sound effects. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's clear that sound, that audio has a great impact. And I, I do think you did a great job of selecting your sound effects and, and mixing them. I also want to uh, just second what Tim said and um, all of the projects today, but a 3D animation in particular just involves so many layers of planning and compartmentalizing to make sure everything doesn't kind of come out in the end and, and fall apart. And you were very organized. And Tim mentioned along the whole process um, just how organized you were and how, how you took it step by step. And it really shows in the end result. So very well done. I will say it looks like several people helped you build your computer at home. And you've got some thanking to do, I think. William just built yeah. a big computer for himself and helped, uh, I'm sure, pull off some of his effects in 3D. Well, yeah, definitely I, a lot of, yeah. Oh, so sorry. Go no, ahead. you go first, William. No, no, no it's fine. It's fine. I, I wanted to, I, everyone uh, agrees that your animation was beautiful. I thought it looked really delicious. Uh, I, you know, when Cameron Sladen came, uh, he told us about thinking about visual metaphors. Did you have anything in mind as you were creating these scenes? Um, yeah, I, I definitely looked upon a lot of um, SEM imaging as well as um, I had the opportunity to see um, a prostatectomy dissection, um, thanks to Karen and her lab. So I got a lot of really good references for, for the type of tissues I could use. And um, 
yeah, just making everything look as slimy and very moist as possible is how the prostate is. <laughs> I thought the prostate cells looked like a bed of mochi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Or jello. <laughs> Any other uh, comments? Oh, sorry. Any other comments from William for William or questions? Great. Thank you very much, William. Really appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Uh oh, got too many lists going on here. So next, let's go to Kellen. Kellen, you also did a beautiful job, beautiful presentation, beautiful project. Um, does anybody have any comments or questions for Kellen? I might have uh, some comments and, and questions as Kellen's preceptor. I'm Jonathan Perry, um, and I want to steal the opportunity to compliment everybody on their work. I think these presentations are always mind-blowing, and I'm astounded by the talent that everybody shows and the amount of work that goes into these projects. And I think Kellen's project in particular, I think, Kellen, you did a great job of putting your project in context you know, the, the the geographic context the biological context and i think that you did a great job of demonstrating that that this is an iterative process you know it's a step-by-step -step building towards something that's informative and also very artistically pleasing um and the thing that that i think is uh, perhaps unique and important scientifically is showing not only the final model, but also what you began working with, um, a very incomplete um, fossil to start with. And so that finally brings me to my question, which is a very general question, uh, because you, you had a lot of troubleshooting to do and a lot of uh, steep learning curves to ascend. Knowing what you know now, would you do anything differently? And if so, what? <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, yeah, like you said, I mean, there's a lot that was learned throughout the entire process. So, you know, I, I really enjoyed this entire project from beginning to end. So thank you and thank you to Jenny for, you know, your constant feedback and support. Um, with all the troubleshooting, obviously, I, I would be able to do it a whole lot better now that I've done it the first time. Um, I think the biggest thing was that first um, hurdle was the sediment removal. And um, just because the data was the same density, and so it was hard to do when I was segmenting, it was hard to um, segment that originally. So I think if I could change anything, it would be kind of how to approach that process, because I thought I would, I would get enough, and then I would start working, and then I would realize, wait, I should probably go back and make sure that all of it's done instead of trying to um, kind of get just enough done to keep moving forward. So I think that was probably one thing that I would go back and, and readdress. Ellen, I had a question about the sediment removal. It, it's, it was so interesting to hear about because it's like prepping an actual paleontological specimen. I was curious, how did you know which polygons were sediment and which was fossil? And then number two, how long did it take you to remove all that sediment? <laughs> Uh, so it happened, <laughs> as Jenny laughs, um, it happened in a couple of phases. So in the beginning, I was I started in ZBrush before removing any sediment and then realized quickly that I lost a lot of functionality through ZBrush, um, you know, like using Booleans and subtracting with different shapes. And so um, I asked Lydia, actually, thank you for her help. Um, and she showed me how to select um, and go go kind of so cut, you know, the skull um, from the outside so that I could protect those areas that I didn't want to delete and then selecting, you know, the majority on the inside. So it was a very tedious process of going inside and outside of the skull to make sure that I was not removing any of the data or those fragments that I needed to keep. So it was just going back and forth and checking if I went too far, then, you know, it was command Z undo um, and then just going back and forth. Actually, I wanted to quickly ask, what, what did you find was your best resource with learning Unity? I was really impressed by how far you got in that application, too. You had so many technological hurdles. Uh, yeah, so um, that's something that's really interesting to me is learning new technology. And so um, thank you, Dr. Perry, because one of the first questions he asked me when we had our first meeting was, what did I want to get out of the project? And so not only was I able to deliver, um, you know, the things that he needed, but it was also kind of tailoring my thesis to 
you know, what interests me and, and was able to keep me excited throughout the project. And so learning unity was um, plural site. There were lots of tutorials and beginner tutorials. And so it, it went through kind of the user interface and they were all um, in digestible chunks. And so I think there was maybe six there. And then as I kind of started getting deeper and deeper into the project, it was a matter of Googling and YouTubing um, different elements, whether that's buttons, um, you know, toggles. And then I also had the help of Sam Bond. She sent me um, her PDF that she presented at um, AMI. And so that was extremely helpful. And then I also had help from um, Kyle Erickson, who is a programmer and he has uh, Unity experience. So I would build a lot of things. And then if something wasn't quite working super well, um, he was able to remote into my computer and explain to me exactly, you know, if I was doing too many things and if I was overlapping too many toggles. And so he was able to really um, kind of develop, help me develop, you know, the things that I was building. Excellent job. Thanks. So as your advisor, um, I just wanted to say that I was really impressed with, you know, I think that Dr. Perry kind of covered it all with the, this iterative process. And, you know, you started from Animate, you went into Unity, um, ZBrush, Cinema 4D, a lot of different things. And it was a very complex workflow. My question is, um, what advice would you give, say, the first years that are thinking about thesis and maybe thinking about a project like this? What advice would you give them um, in terms of uh, what you learned in your workflow? So first, if they have any questions, um, read my thesis. No. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> I don't know if they have any questions, but um, I think there's a lot of information on the internet and being able to YouTube, there are more than one way, you know, one way of doing something. And so I think one of the biggest hurdles was finding that YouTube video and sticking with that one instead of watching so many and being like, oh shoot, which one should I use? But there is a lot of information on YouTube. Um, I want to thank you and Mike Lincolnhoger because during Animate, that really helped me dip my toes into coding. And so I was able to, you know, dissect the different codes that I was using for um, Unity. And that really helped like that trajectory and, you know, getting everything coded. So yeah, I, I recommend keeping Animate, but I also you know, recommend getting into Unity, too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be doing both. And Kellen, just, yeah. just one last uh, thing. You may have seen this on the uh, comments in YouTube, but Sarah Ferris, who teaches, one of our alumna, who teaches down at the Virginia Commonwealth, uh, uh, Virginia, VCU, um, just commented that your model-making process and how you described it is going to be a really valuable resource for anybody who reads your thesis. So you did a good job of documenting the process, um, and Thank she you. noticed that, and others did as well. So Thank well you. done. Thanks. Well done. Great. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Perry, and thanks, Jane. Good job. Now we go to Morgan. Morgan Sullivan. Morgan, you did a great job. Uh, beautiful. I've seen your presentation many times, but it was a joy to watch it again, and it was a joy to watch um, to work with you. But I'll let others comment and ask questions and uh, come back and have something to say. Any comments for Morgan? I think. Uh, Hi, this is Sarah Poynton. <laughs> hey, Sarah. Hi, um, I wanted really to um, compliment you on that really beautiful color palette. Um, I think considering the very sensitive nature of what you were talking about, to have chosen something that was so calming. Um, to me, it reminded me of, you know, looking up at the night sky and seeing all the little stars. Um, so I like that very much. Um, and also, if I may, just um, share some comments that are applicable to you, but also with, with the others. I thought it was truly an exceptional level of professionalism. Um, your vocal delivery, along with that of all the other students, was really exceptional. Um, you've all shown remarkable grace under the most extraordinary circumstances, um, which has been very humbling to work with all of you. And you have all exemplified, I think, a very rare skill. And that is to make something so complex appear to be so simple. And I think that's a remarkable skill. So really, um, kudos to all of you. 
um, just remarkable. Thank you all so much. You helped a lot in that process as well. Thank, Thank you, you, Sarah. Um, Morgan, as one of your preceptors, uh, um, I would like to share with the rest of the group how uh, tremendous it's been to watch this process and to really see you take something that was not only biologically complicated, complicated science, basic science, policy, clinical practice, uh, patient interaction, community interaction, um, and really distill it down to something that was doable and brilliantly illustrated. Um, I have to say, I've never seen a square with more personality than the little <laughs> square that you had trying to make his decision of whether to uh, to sign up as a donor or not. And that that really re it reminded me of some of the the beautiful um, you know animation that we've seen in film where they really take an inanimate object and give it a beautiful personality, which I thought was really cool. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously the content was really beautifully presented and this will be very helpful to us as we uh, try to destigmatize HIV and promote HIV positive donation and things like that. Um, I will ask you uh, a two part question um, just for my own curiosity. Uh, the first part is what can you share with the group something you learned about HIV that surprised you? Um, and then the second part of the question is maybe share with us something that you learned either technical or more abstract from a, a design perspective that you are going to take with you to your next project that won't have anything to do with HIV or transplantation. Absolutely. Um, I think HIV, it's a very well-known concept and virus, and we had pathology before starting thesis. And we had to present on a specific pathology and I chose AIDS and HIV. And when I was delving into that, I encountered HIV superinfection and the different strains of HIV. I remember when I explained that to the audience and my fellow classmates, I could see the look of surprise and just awe in the audience because I was not aware about that HIV exists in different strains and that if somebody has HIV, they don't necessarily have just one version, they have multiple types. Per like possibly at the same time. And then when that's transferred, you know, there are multiple types that can be transferred at the same time. And that, that was just astonishing. And it makes sense when you think about the complexity of this um, transplantation. It's not just one type to one type. It's multiple different strains. Um, it's a complex intertwining web of HIV types. And that was really fascinating. And it was really fun to try to explain that visually in a way that's calming and easy to understand for patient audiences. And then to answer your, your the second part of your question, this, this project was a very fun exploration into metaphorical storytelling. I worked closely with my constant, content expert, Brianna Adobe, um, and we were thinking about how to visualize some of these abstract topics. And the initial thought is to picture a donor and a recipient and a character figure and you could literally show organ transplantation, but that could be jarring or it could be not very comfortable. And so we wanted to create a style of animation that was inclusive to all audiences, regardless of age or ethnicity or, um, you know, and so that was a really fun dive into metaphorical visuals. And so that, that style guide that I ended up creating to visualize donors and recipients with and without HIV is a way to calmly explain these complicated scientific topics to patient audiences. Yeah, and it's really beautiful. Um, not only is it race agnostic, but it's also um, sex gender agnostic. And especially when you're uh, dealing with, you know, a population that may include a large number of people who don't identify necessarily in a binary way. I thought that, that that was really beautiful. And, you know, a square is just a person. Yeah. Morgan, I wanted to say this, this goes a little bit to Dory's question and a little bit to your answer, but I just want to compliment you on your decision early on. I remember when you first thought about the thesis, you were very excited to do uh, high end 3d work and, you know, this big 3d animation. And you have the skills, of course, and the experience to have done that, but I feel like you made a decision based on your audience 
and the type of information that you were trying to transmit. It wasn't just a time or a, um, a technique uh, limited decision, but I think that you really thought of it as an illustrator and as Doria said, the, the results I think are going to mean a lot to the, the population um, that will be watching this and hopefully will learn from it. So I think that was really a, a, a well a well placed decision. Good job. Thanks. It was fun to work with you both. And thanks for letting me do 2D animation, David. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, final questions or comments for Morgan? I just want to ask real quick, uh, it's such an effective piece and it's so beautiful and such an important uh, public health message. Uh, do you or Dr. Dora already know uh, where it's going to be uh, uh, posted and, and how are we going to get the word out? Yeah, um, you know, we have uh, efforts now to um, promote understanding of this in the population of people living with HIV and I think it will be shown in um, conferences, which, you know, the world is more virtual now, which actually makes this um, even more relevant and more timely uh, that we did not know <laughs> when putting this together. Um, and so, you know, we thought we could make something that could just get shown on a TV in the background at a conference that people would kind of linger by and watch or shown during a, a lecture or something like that. But now, you know, with everyone turning to their computer and figuring out cool ways to do Zoom backgrounds and things like that. I think um, having something like this out there, we could even propagate this faster than we would have been able to without, um, you know, without this, uh, this new challenge for our world. So I, I think I can even see it coming out faster than we had initially intended. For sure. Great, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Morgan. And now we go on to Noel. Uh, Noel, wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to open the field up for questions and comments for Noel. I guess I'll start. Deb Schwingel, uh, one of Noel's uh, preceptors. Uh, I, I want you all to know that when we started this, this thing was formless and void. I mean, it was a blank slate, uh, and we, we knew what we wanted to teach, but Noel did so much work. Uh, she developed not only visual, but uh, process uh, that is essential when you're developing a game. Um, and I don't know if Rob wants to add anything. Yeah, at this I point. was also a, a privilege to work with Noelle. Um, she not only sort of created the image that of, of bringing it to reality for us, but she also drove it to a certain degree in helping us understand what needed to be seen. Um, and I and I think that the other thing that she did, which was uh, really courageous, was not go the high tech digital way, but made it a very um, a sort of uh, inviting tabletop game, which uh, really would let anybody be able to learn how to do it, and with uh, with very little resources, which is really what we need. So thank you. And I guess, uh, you know, I'd like to ask Noelle, given our current circumstances with the pandemic, um, ha are, are we on the right track with the game? Would you revise anything? What would you say now at, after a lot of re reflection of the, the past year's work and, and where we are today? Um, yeah, I think that we are on the right track for the game. Uh, thank you both. You were wonderful to work with. Um, I think that one of the things that would be the greatest contribution to the game, uh, particularly um, so that it can serve different um, scenarios, so it can be used in different scenarios, would be, even though we kept it a tabletop, to be able to expand that tabletop um, into a, a mixed um, media event. Um, that would allow the triage patients and some of the other um, like uh, simulation elements to progress over time, which would help engage the, um, the user more heavily into the simulation and then also allow them to experience um, uh, different scenarios that might pop up throughout the game and be more realistic, I suppose, <laughs> in the end. 
I found your game so impressive and timely. Uh, all the issues you are addressing are everything that our country and our world is going through right now, all the considerations that have to be made. And, and uh, I, it, it, it's just really well done. Thank you, Tim. Noel did uh, so much usability testing for this game, and I was lucky enough to participate in one of the sessions. It was a lot of fun. Uh, Noel, during that uh, whole process, do you have any interesting or insightful or surprising anecdotes that you, you notice while user testing? Uh, well, I suppose um, my first user test, I was actually really surprised with the ability of people to adapt to a situation that they were unfamiliar with. Um, we, um, if you were, you were watching the presentation, you saw that our first prototype was pretty uh, rudimentary, didn't have a lot of images, and everyone was able to um, do a surprising job of being of investing themselves in the scenario. Um, it didn't actually take much fidelity for people to start engaging um, in team-based decision making, and I think that was the the most surprising thing for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, did I answer your question, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, I got a, I got a second question. I, I I was early on, and I don't know if you had more art later on. But do you? Uh, how do you feel the art affects the the game? Um, so I think that it sets the scene. Um, it allowed people to experience the game in a couple of different ways. One, it helps anchor them to the scenario, um, to the, the roles. You saw that there were illustrations on the role cards. I think that um, having those illustrations help people automatically look at the card and process that information without having to read it. So um, I guess it speeds up their interaction with the game. And then also, as I said earlier, it helps um, invest them into the game. Part of one of the biggest changes we made between the operational prototype and my final prototype is we finally made the call to just really add illustrations onto the triage cards. Um, and I think that those illustrations are going to do a lot to get people to quickly recognize the patient category um, and then be able to build upon that um, by reviewing the patient uh, the make makeup patient data on the back of the card. So hopefully they'll be able to make those decisions quicker, and that will also help invest them in the storyline of the of the game as well. Noel, as your faculty advisor, I want to congratulate you on such a great job on uh, this project. Uh, one of the questions that I had was, uh, given that the alternative to, uh, I guess, having a group of people practice this would be kind of a, a hospital-wide uh, simulation of an event like that. I'm wondering uh, what observations did you make of uh, the interactions between those that were uh, playing the physical board game that maybe uh, were unique to that kind of a, a medium for learning? And how would that be different if you augmented it with the digital format? Um, so I think that the biggest difference between, well, uh, obviously scale is a large difference between um, the hospital-wide simulation and the um, more intimate uh, setting of a game board. But I think that one of the real strengths of having a tabletop game board is that people can um, learn directly from one another um, get an opportunity to interact um, with the with the material as a team, but in a small, um, intimate setting. Um, and they can also take it on each other's roles. So what one element of the game that we um, envisioned early on and that we continue to play throughout all of the prototypes was that if you were a nurse, you wouldn't be playing the nurse role when you came into the um, to play the game. And one of the, I think the end results of that is perspective building and that perspective building on what other people are experiencing during these sorts of events um, allows you to function better as a team because you can anticipate their potential needs after you've taken on their role. Um, for the, the difference between that 
And the digital version, I don't think I entirely understood your question, and I would like you to repeat it. <laughs> I'm just wondering how you think the gameplay will change and how the interactions will change when you uh, put in the, the digital facilitator. And, um, what other aspects does, does that bring to the project? Yeah, so I think that the hope is that the team, the intimate team-based environment won't change all of that much. The digital facilitator would just be able to add some additional learning elements, um, like we would be able to begin the um, training game with an instructional video, which would help people understand the complicated nature of it and be able to tie to some um, specific uh, vocabulary terms that they might not have been familiar with um, as they see them pop up throughout the game. Um, and then the consistency between separate, separate events when you have a human facilitator um, helping guide the progression through the game, there is always going to be some variation because the human facilitator is going to make some choices to be able to get people to move forward or to answer questions or whatever. Um, and in the digital facilitator, you'd be able to just have that um, consistency throughout different staging, which I think is important for um, repeat training events to have consistency between them. Great job. Thanks, Juan. Great. Thank you, Noel. Um, everyone, I just want to say thank you again. Yeah, let's give Noel a round of applause. Um, I just want to thank everyone again, uh, the preceptors, the faculty, for all the hard work that you put in for the students and with the students. And I especially want to thank the students. I know this was a little bit of a leap of faith. That this, this is the first time that we've done the thesis presentations in this way. And I think it worked really well. And as Sarah said earlier, I'm just going to uh, second what Sarah Point said earlier. You were all grace under fire. You've been through a lot of changes over the last... How many weeks? I don't even know how long it's been over the last several weeks. And you have just stayed um, productive and positive. And we really um, are proud of you for that and really uh, commend you for that. So really well done. Thanks, everybody. And by the Thank way, we still much. have um, nearly 100 people watching us on YouTube Live. So people, you guys were really, um, many people found the presentations and your, your answer is very interesting. Corey. Hello. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank everyone in the YouTube live audience as well. And it's really important for me to let everyone know that tremendous effort that David and Daisha have made this week. I'm not being dramatic saying that it was a night. There were nightmares this week related uh, to these these presentations. I think um, some of the positive outcomes from this pandemic are that we may revise going forward some of the ways that our students present. The pre-recorded sessions are phenomenal and show an, um, an entire additional skill set that you guys possess. So we may consider ways to do that in the future. I mean, you guys just hit it out of the park. Um, David and Daisha, we could not have done it without you guys. Sarah Poynton, we owe a lot of thanks to. And I, I just think that um, we will never forget this year. We will never forget these seven students, faculty and preceptors. It's been amazing. Um, this is a little bit of a recruitment effort to get preceptors for next year. If people are interested in taking on a project or if you wanna share a recording with your colleagues, I'm talking to the preceptors now, um, please let me know because I'm looking for more proposals by mid-May and would be happy to talk to people about how the projects work. So um, thank you all very much. And I would just like to close this session with a big round of applause. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to make one comment. Oh, actually, Gary. Yeah. I, I had a hard time getting into this part of the, the session. But um, this, all seven of the, the thesis presentations were just wonderful. Um, I, I think they're the best I think I've ever seen. Um, they went off beautifully. The, the sound was great. And I think the big congratulations that I'd like to offer is very similar to what uh, Corey just said. Um, I happen to have seen uh, a part of yesterday's uh, panic, I guess, uh, of uh, trying to get this all together. And I know how hard David and Daisha 
work to, to get this off. And I'm just so proud to be a part of the faculty uh, with these wonderful presentations. So congratulations to all seven. And I look forward to seeing you in the future, if not back in Baltimore, certainly at the future AMI meetings. You are wonderful. Uh, so thank you very much for including me. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> I thought maybe William and Gary had switched places. <laughs> oh. Florida background. All right, everybody. Yeah, I, we have that outside, but you can't see that. I'm in my office here, and uh, uh, there's not uh, a window on this side. There's one to my uh, left. But congratulations again. It was wonderful. Thank you, everybody. And please stay safe and healthy. And uh, thank you again. Have a nice evening. Have a nice weekend. Well done, everybody. Thanks, miss, Jenny. Thanks, Dr. Perry. We miss all of you second years in the department. Congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Bye. Congratulations, Bob. Bye. Congratulations.